This is the smell of a warm three-day-old egg salad sandwich in a wimpy trash bag. Wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. Blech. And this is the smell of that same sandwich in a hefty, ultra-strong trash bag with new Fabuloso lemon scent. Hefty, hefty, hefty. Ah, <sighs> smell the difference. When life gives you stinky, get Hefty Ultra Strong with new Fabuloso Lemon Scent. It smells like clean, freshly picked lemons. So no matter what's inside your trash, you can stop the stink and smell the lemon. The drive to go further and reach higher. The same thing that inspires you, inspires us. At Strayer University, we're always searching for new ways to make education more affordable. That's why we offer access to up to 10 no-cost gen ed courses to help you save time and money. So you can keep striving. Visit Strayer.edu to learn more. No cost gen provided by Strayer University affiliates of field learning. Eligibility rules apply. Connect with us for details. Strayer University is certified to operate in Virginia by Chef. All right, big announcement. Uh, everyone who's been asking about podcast merch, your wish has come true. We have uh, the the, uh, the the merch store is open. Uh, I partnered with... Uh, T public to uh, make our merch because I can't handle another business. Uh, so they are handling all the merchandise printing and uh, fulfillment. All you got to do is go to bigtruthpodcast.com backslash store, or just go to bigtruthpodcast.com and hit the store tab at the top and um, a page will come up and you just hit the link and it'll bring you right over to the store. we got all kinds of stuff there. This is dumb stuff, stuff you'll never need, but uh, because they're a merch fulfillment company, so the world's your oyster. There's all kinds of funny stuff there. But, you know, all the standards are there. T-shirts, long sleeves, uh, summer's coming, you want to rep in a tank top. There's tank tops, there's crew necks, hoodies, um, baseball shirts, kids stuff, coffee mugs, travel mugs, whatever. Phone cases, dumb stuff, like I was saying. So check it out, bigtruth.com. Um, hit the store. Link at the top there and, and uh, go on your way. You can get lost on the on the store there forever. There's three designs right now. Uh, more coming soon. Also, big shout out to my homie Pub uh, from upstate New York. He is the latest uh, Patreon subscriber. I forgot to shout him out last time. But big shout out to my brother Pub uh, holding it down in upstate New York. Buffalo, um, home of the wings, right? Uh, you got to check out his family's a restaurant if you're out, out there and I'm a jerk and I can't remember it right now the name of it but I will remember it and shout it out next time um yes and you know if you need any uh motorcycle related stuff parts apparel helmet whatever come check us out at Chopperhead 13 County Road East Freetown Massachusetts full brick and mortar motorcycle shop not just an online uh warehouse um full service shop you know you need an oil change full custom bike built anything in between we handle it we also go to showroom and a parts counter and everything um if you are not local check us out chopahead.com c-h-o-p-p-a-h-e-a-d spelt in the mass holy ways uh that that we uh, practice here um and uh yeah just check it out or follow us on instagram at chopahead and you know you find all the links there um also, if you need some art, you you know, you're looking around your garage, your house, your apartment, your cell, your cubicle, you know, wherever, and you, you notice some holes that you want to fill with some artwork that uh, fulfills you mentally or physically or spiritually, you need to check out TattooFlashCollective.com. It's a uh, DIY um, industry uh Tattoo industry, um, art supply company. Um, so what that means, if you want tattoo flash, whether it's for your tattoo shop or just for your house, they got tattoo flash from artists all over the world. And um, and it's run by people involved in the tattoo industry. It's not some corporate uh, bull, you know what I mean? Um, so, but they also have posters, um, different art prints on different types of paper. You can get museum quality stuff, you know? Um, and they have books. They got all kinds of stuff. So check them out, Tattoo Flash Collective, uh, at TattooFlashCollective.com or on Instagram at Tattoo Flash Collective. If you use the promo code Big Truth at checkout, you get 10% off your order. I'm going to cut it short here because uh, I'm excited to get on with this episode. It's going to be a good one. I've been looking forward to it for a while. You'll understand when you listen to it. And so without further ado, let's jump into it right now. We have 
have a liftoff. Yes, once again, we have liftoff. I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Big Truth Podcast. And my guest tonight really doesn't need an introduction, but, you know, I got to do it anyway. So he's, he, he's got a lot going on. So let me, I'm going to, I'm going to try and do this list right off the top of my head. And if I miss any, we'll, we'll go back and do it later. We'll add it in later, but he's a yogi, um, a teacher, a uh, Former monk, um, author, explorer, uh, has a podcast or a podcaster, and just a, a man on a spiritual journey. Uh, and you may know him from his old band. Uh, he had a band called Violent Children you might be aware of. Um, but, you know, without further ado, let me introduce the artist formerly known as Ray Capo, Big Ragu himself, my man, Raganoth. What's happening, man? I'm, I'm stoked to have you here. I know you're transmitting live from upstate New York, so if we have any connectivity issues, we'll, we'll come back with a, after any brief delays from technical issues. But how are you doing tonight, man? Good. Thanks so much. Yeah, the, 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 um, the phone service up here always stinks. So, uh, yeah. I'll try my best to stay on. I got one bar as it's going right now. <laughs> it's all right. I'm just letting people know we might have some issues, but hopefully not. But, you know, in it, in it, whatever, man. But the benefits of living, you know, out in the, out in like somewhere like upstate, you know, far outweighs the inconvenience of having one bar. You know what I mean? Like, you, I'm sure it's a, a beautiful area. It, you know what? There's definitely something to say that uh, we've collapsed part of our joy living creating a world indoors sometimes they talk about creating these cities that are totally indoors and it's actually very sad because um i I know just because of uh i came back late last night i was in florida and i uh got home and i got sort of late in the game and i had to take my son to school and i just had to work behind my computer all day long uh besides a little bit of indoor exercise and a little bit of you know infrared sauna I did this morning, I didn't really go outside. Mm. And even though I was productive, I was feeling like I'm, I am I had a big plan to go for a long walk today and I just didn't do it. So I said, you know what? I'm just, and, and, and then it started raining. And so then I just said, you know what? I'm just going to put on my raincoat and walk outside. And I tell you, it only took about 15 minutes for me to just, there's something about the connection with mother earth and nature and even when it's raining out, it, it just it, it it just makes the mind lighter, and you just feel more connected. And and I think uh, it's a big thing. I think that's uh, sort of like missing in culture nowadays. We've created an indoor culture where we say things like, "I got to spend more time outside." I mean, we're beings. We are wild beings, but we've created ourselves to be a little bit domesticated. Oh, absolutely. So we've taken, like, We're house cats. Instincts. We're house cats now, man. We're like lame house cats. <laughs> Eating lame foods, having, losing our sense of a, our, our animal instincts, and um, a little lazy. And, um, yeah. Isn't it wild? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, isn't it wild, though, like, like, I mean, when I was young, I loved living in the city. Like, I lived in Boston. I lived in Providence. I lived in Atlanta and stuff. And I even, mm-hmm. like, Geneva, Switzerland and stuff. And then the older I get, man, I just want to be farther out in the woods. And, like, now I, I live about half hour south of Boston uh, in a town called Freetown. And it's, like, there's a big, you know, 15,000-acre forest here and stuff and to go hiking in and stuff. And it, you just feel way more relaxed and connected, like you like you were kind of alluding to, you know? It's, yeah. Uh, Sometimes people grow up in the city and they're, especially New York City, I, I see this a lot, but they grow up there and they think, yeah, there's nothing outside of New York. I can't go anywhere. What am I crazy? Am I going to go anywhere else? And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I lived in New York on and off my whole life. And then um, then I lived in eight, Los Angeles for eight years. And I tell you, I got, and then I went back to New York City. And then I tell you, I'm just, I'm very, very, very over it. Yeah. Especially when you're raising kids too. It's raising kids in the city is horrific. Oh, I can imagine. And yeah, you're forced to keep them inside. You can't let them run out. And you're we never had a TV in the house. But when I lived in New York City, I'm forced to get a TV because you can't entertain them twenty four seven. You can't let them wander. And they have certain parks that they can go to. And the whole thing, for me at least, and for my kids, it was hellish. And I I, I was glad to trade in that television for a creek yeah. and that became their new uh 
source of entertainment, like sitting at the creek and building fires. That was our thing. Um, so yeah, I happen to raise kids out up, upstate. And for me, again, it's just like, it's therapy. We sort of, the Tennessee has just override those natural desires to be connected with the earth. And then um, we get sort of mesmerized by the city, and at least at this stage of my life. And I don't know if it's me or if I don't know if it's the stage of life, but I'm over it. Yeah. I like being a visitor in the city. I swoop in, hang out, see yeah. friends and stuff, and then swoop out. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm like a visitor. I'm like a hawk. I just fly in there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, man. Had, my mother lives there. My mother's lived there her whole life. Oh, okay. I mean, she, she raised us in Connecticut, but for the most part, she's a, a real New Yorker. And my brothers and sisters are all New Yorkers. Yeah. So, I, I mean, we could talk about this all day, but I know people want to hear a little bit about your past and, you know, where you are and, you know, your experiences. And we could talk about the book because I'm sure a lot of this is going to be more outlined in the book. But why don't we bring it back to like Lower East Side, New York in like the 80s, man? Like, how did you find your way into the hardcore and like punk, the, the world of that? And of course, and I, and I was kidding. I was, you know, he, Ray was in Violent Children, but everyone knows he was in Youth of Today and Shelter and Better Than a Thousand and other bands like that. But um, I, I was just giving a nod to Violent Children because yeah, I loved I wonder that. What about. <laughs> What's that? That was my high school band that I played drums in. But I was like, oh, maybe that's all he knows me from. No, nah, no, nah, <laughs> I'm just messing around. I'm from Boston, man. We're ball busters. You know that. <laughs> yeah. So we were... Um, so yeah, this is all in my new book, which is coming out in a week or so. It's called uh, "From Punk to Monk," and it basically was the, you know, sort of the, my memoir, my story of my life. Which I, I personally, I was like, well, big deal. My my life. I was never in jail. I was never in drugs. I was never in rehab. Uh, you know, I, um, but the publisher was like, no, man, your story is good. You got to write your story. And the more I wrote my story down, my life story, it it was. Um, it's been, you know, quite an interesting journey. I got just into uh, alternative types of music back when, you know, in the eighties, there was nothing but corporate arena rock. And so I would go to New York city where my parents were from. They raised us in Connecticut, but I had older brothers at that point that were living in New York city. And so I'd go visit my brothers on the weekend and I would end up in the Greenwich village and the lower East side. And I just got turned on to just, you know, it was the eighties. It was like, it was not just punk and hardcore. It was everything was out there. Yeah. It was just united by a type of freakdom. And if you weren't like a corporate into Jay Giles band or into, you know, Duran Duran or into like just, you know, regular arena rock and roll, you were a weirdo. You were a freak, you know? Oh yeah. So if you were, Susie Sue and the Banshees or the X-Ray Specs or the, you know, Gnostic Front or it, it, or the Bad Brains. It was just like you were a weirdo. And sort of you sort of gravitated to these parts of the cities where these weirdos hung out. So that's what I did. And then you'd go have an, a weekend experience and you'd go back to your suburban high school and the rest of the people would like have no clue. You know, just like the insanity that was New York City in 1982 and 83 when I first started hanging out. And it was like, it was sort of like exciting and raw and unpretentious mixed with an element of danger for a kid that was always sort of exciting too. Yeah. Um, um, and no one knew where I was going. My parents didn't, had no clue what I was doing. And I would just go with a couple friends I knew from my high school. And that's how I sort of, I learned everything from street smarts to my ethics and, you know, um, how to relate to people and how to be careful around dangerous people and yeah. how to, uh, you know, you, you just sort of like learn it on your own from a child as a child when at any minute someone could, you know, punch your face in for no good reason, or there's people trying to sell you drugs or there was, you learned to, you learned a lot that the, that a lot of America struggles with now, like tolerance between people that are different than you sure. and just sort of accepting people. And again, we were a whole like community of freaks. So you learn just to accept people as they are. And, um, you appreciate it. Oh, sorry. You know, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, it's hard yeah. when we don't when we're not seeing each other. But isn't it isn't it crazy the freedom we had before there was like cell phones and like being monitored twenty four hours a day, like just the free to roam, like the the shit we would it, all get into. Like you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's amazing how we ever even met so, up with each. Like ha, okay, meet me here at this time. You can't be late for a moment. Yeah, yeah it, it was it was amazing how you had to get around. You know, before there was maps on your phones and googling if something's open just pre-cell phone was a whole nother world and it's almost like we're starting to take it for granted and my kids who grew up on the other side of it like they can't even imagine a world without it you know i remember once my son was i had a big road map in my truck and my son was well what's that i said oh it's a map and he goes map you mean like maps and i was like yeah it's just like maps yeah. Except it's a, it's an actual map. Yeah, it's the analog version. Yeah, <laughs> it's the odd version of a yeah. So yeah, and the same and, and back in that music scene was very cool too because you have all these bands that are sort of starting, forming, you know, like inspiring and then disappearing, just breaking up. And the only thing they left was like they printed one thousand vinyl seven inches, yeah. which now the whole world wants because the scene was growing and everybody wants these. And um, it, they were hard to get, and then the, the record collecting fervor kicked in, and, um, and and then that became a whole thing in itself. So it was really it was a really sort of uh, sort of uh, sort of a romantic time to be into music culture in New York City in the '80s, which was filled with everything from dance clubs to after hours clubs and illegal after hours clubs mm-hmm. and cool music and hip hop and. Um, street art was, you know, just surfacing and break dancing. Yeah. It was, it was, it's the game. So that's how I got in and just sort of like as a kid from Connecticut gunning on the, uh, the train and, and going up and checking it out. And then by the time I was, uh, you know, 19 or 18, just moving to the city and, um, you know, that's where youth of, youth of today was sort of starting from there. Yeah. I, I, that time was so great too. Like I wasn't, I, I came around like the mid eighties to, to late eighties. Um, okay. but just, I remember getting to New York, like we would take the bus when I was like 15, 16 years old and just trying to f- get to CBGB's to go to a show and then sleeping in the Port Authority and catching the first bus home in the morning. You know, it was just wild. And it was like, wow. that was the adventure just getting there. And like, you never know, mind the craziness. Once you were there, it was, it, it was, was definitely some type of insane pil- <laughs> twisted pr- first pilgrimage yeah. to get to the Lower East Side. And, 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 you know, we were 16, you know, or yeah. 17. It's intimidating because there, it was a, it was a lawless time in New York city. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. We literally get away with murder. So you never knew if you were going to be on the receiving end of a beat down for no good reason. And, um, it, not just within the punk scene, but, the neighborhoods that the music was played at. Yeah, yeah. It was Avenue A, Avenue B. It was everything was sort of threatening, but I will say it made me sort of grow up quick. Um and um and it sort of, the whole scene itself inspired me to be very proactive in my life. You know, I, I wanna make a band, so I'm gonna learn how to play this instrument. I wanna I'm gonna find people to get to, to play with. I'm gonna try to keep this band together. I'm gonna to try to get a gig. I'm gonna to try to book a tour. I wanna I wanna he- get my music heard. So I'm gonna create a record label. I wanna I wanna create a magazine for that record label. And it, it, it was one proactive thing after another, and the scene was really encouraging in that. And um, yeah, uh, I never took a course on branding or you know music business or accounting maybe i should have but um but i was i was just forced to learn all those things on my own and it was it was a great education yeah yeah absolutely man and and like you said it also sets the foundation for the rest of your life like because you know you 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 have a different kind of there's, when we were 16 and making records and and, uh, and you were a little bit before me like it you know and doing all this stuff on our own like you know you got like like a weird, I don't know. It's not in, you weren't industrious, but like you didn't. You learned not to count on anyone else for anything. You didn't need like a big corporate record label. You didn't yeah. need a big publishing house. You could just do. You know, like like I'll just do it myself and keep it with keep it here. You know, and and there was some, 
very, very liberating about that. Yeah. Um, and uh, you're right. And it, and it did set you up for the, your adult life, like to become a little bit fearless. And I'm going to just try that. Why not? Yeah. And some, and we sort of laugh when we see bands waiting around for management and waiting around for a deal. And we think like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> that's sad. You're not just doing it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I think it helped me out in my adult life. And to this day, I pretty much never worked for anybody. I've sort of skated through life at 58 years old now and <laughs> never re- had a real job. Hey, and man. I think maybe that's something good. Sure, man. Yeah, a, you, you you kept it like punk punk rock, you know, all the way. See, you know, and and I know we have um kind of limited time, so I'm going to skip around a little bit. Um, sure. Uh, and and all this is awesome, and I encourage everyone to order the book because I'm sure a lot of this will be extrapolated in way more more depth. But a, a question I have to ask you, just as a personal thing, I know you and Ray. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I know you and Purcell were like big time record collectors, and when I was a kid, I was huge, huge record collector, and there was something about that time was magical again before internet. Like when you wanted something, you really had to hunt it down and you, and you appreciated it so much more when you found that rare record. Um, and two things I want to ask you, one, what, what was like your most, like, not, I don't know, not to be materialistic, but like, what was the most prized, like a rare record that you have that you like absolutely loved or like appreciated so much? Cause I know this, this, you know what I mean? I know you are a hardcore collector, a hardcore collector. And, um, I'm going to steal this. This may sound arrogant, but people collected. But I think between me and Purcell, we turned it into a feeding frenzy because <laughs> it was sort of like it, it was only sort of like I knew a handful of collectors, and they were sort of older than me from an older generation. Yeah, it wasn't like it's but but when. We used to walk around Lower East Side and we used to put want lists up. Like, we want these records and we will trade our want lists and our trade list. And then when Revelation, our record company, started, we started making limited edition things exclusively for trading for other things. Oh, I know. I had had the together on uh, orange vinyl or gold vinyl. Yeah. (laughs) Exclusively to create almost like um, scarcity so we could trade for things that we want. It would cost us whatever, a dollar or less to print, yeah, and we yeah. could trade things that were worth $100. You so guys were like the original like, Bitcoin, just making your own currency. We were, <laughs> it, was, it was so Bitcoin, we were just creating, <laughs> it was creating our own currency, and it was only to feed our silly record-collecting desires. Well, who was the G.I. So, Joe guy? Was that one of you guys, or was that Jordan that was that was trading hold, the G.I. Joe stuff? Hold that, I'm about to get there. So... <laughs> So you you asked what like what what was my best find? Yeah, or like your like your like like the your holy grail record that you had. There was a period of time, I'd say about a year, where people weren't into record collecting yet in the scene, and me and Purcell really were, and so we went through every store you could think of, even obscure ones in uh, you know in New York City, yeah. and we picked everything apart. We picked them dry and we knew what to ask for. And the, I think the best find I ever got was I, there was a, a record store I used to go to and um, they had a bunch of weird, obscure live records, like live Devo records. But to get something live back then was really unique, a, a live bootleg LP. Sure. So you had to go to weird stores. So they're weird punk stores. They didn't necessarily sell hardcore records, but it was all sort of mixed up. And they had thousands of singles on the wall, but you couldn't really see. You had to like ask for something and they'd go through them. And I remember once thinking, I bet they have a Bad Brains single here. And the Bad Brains single was always hard to get. Sure. Was it pay to come? Yeah, pay to come. And I went and he was going through the B section and then I saw him pass it. And I, I said, that's it right there, the bad brains. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I, I got it. It's $2. Damn. And I, <laughs> I how many? And it, how many do you have? And he says, uh, I got 10 copies. And I go, yeah, I'll take, here's 20 bucks. I'll take them all. Wow. And so, yeah, to walk out with 10 copies of the bad brains. And you, you could just tell the bad brains must have brought them there. You know, that was probably 1984, or 1985. Yeah. 
So the Bat Brains probably showed up three years earlier or four years earlier and brought them to this record store and they just sat on a shelf. And, they, and there, was still, there was still stuff that was just slightly buried under the earth that you could just easily excavate. Yeah. So me and Pers- were sort of like famous for just like picking through record stores and stuff like that. So was it wasn't even chip. worth going. You couldn't even go into Bleaker Bob's or something after you guys left because you know no, you're, well, you already no, left with Bleak, everything. <laughs> Bleaker Bob's knew what they had. Yeah, yeah. you got to find stores that didn't even know what they had. So there was another place on. Uh, it was on Bleaker Street, but west of Sixth Avenue, and I got some great stuff from there too. Just you, you can great. give it up now. They're not there anymore. You can give the sources up now. <laughs> I think it was uh, no. I think it was called Bleaker Street Jazz. Oh, okay. I don't know. All that, but I had every like punk single on the wall that was sort of weird, hard to get. I got all my X Ray Spec singles there. I got all my No Fun records there. I got all my Posh Boy record singles there. And then I and then I knew they had a Bad Brains thing too. So every week I'd come in. Hey, do you have Bad Brains singles? And he said, Yeah, I got the original one with the picture sleeve. I was like, Oh, that's the really hard. That's the first pressing. That's a really hard one to get. So he would say, Yeah. I have thousands of records back here. I'm going to find it. I'm going to hold it for you. I go in every week and ask for this. Uh, and then Purcell, because Purcell looks a little bit like me for some reason, he went in there one day and the guy goes, Hey, I got that bad brain single for you. And he gave it to Purcell. <laughs> I had 10 second pressing bad brain singles, which were rare. He had one first pressing with the picture sleeve, which got, got my goat really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it was that, that was, was for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was for me. Yeah, but we both had very good rivaling co- collections, and then I got to this point where see, I, I was a I was just a collector of vintage things. Period. I collected, you know, nineteen seventies lunch boxes and nineteen, you know, nineteen seventies like GI Joe action figures, and and Jordan, my partner in the record company, collected Batman figures and Star Wars figures, and so we thought, and all those things to 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 purchase them, they were also sort of in a demand. It was hard to get them. They were all super expensive. It was over a hundred dollars for a GI Joe. Back then that was a lot. Yeah. And so he said to me, uh, I said, you know what we should do? We should advertise. uh, We will give you rare records for your old GI Joe, Star Wars figures, et cetera. And I tell you, boxes started coming in and it was, it was amazing. Yeah. It's a filled, all our material desires. <laughs> and that's interesting. I tell the story in my book because I, I used to do yoga at the time, which was really obscure, believe it or not, in 1986. No one did yoga unless you were sort of a, affiliated with some, you know, Eastern, you know, Eastern guru or something. But I was really interested in that type of thing. And so I was at some ashram on 24th Street reading, sitting in their library, reading the books. And it asked us, the, 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 the author posed this question, is your happiness coming from your ego or is your happiness coming from yourself? And I thought, well, I don't, let's see, I, where's my happiness come from? So I'm thinking, well, I like my record collection. And I thought, yeah, I like my record collection. That's, but I said, wait a second, isn't that my ego? And I thought, no, I like the music. But I thought, well, it's not just the music because I, I never play the records I have because you damage the records. So if you collect records, you rarely play your rare co- sure. records. You always play, back then you played it on cassette. You know, so we had cassettes of everything we love. Yeah. Nowadays, save it on, you know, their iPhone. But back then we, we had cassettes of everything we love, but we never played the actual records. And I thought, well... Or just that one time that? to record it, you know? That, yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I was like, how do I know that this isn't my rare... What, maybe I'm getting... Maybe I'm getting the pleasure from uh, my ego then because I'm only getting pleasure when somebody comes over. Some other collector set comes over and says, wow, you have the antidote test pressing. Wow, you have the crowd singles. Wow, you have yeah. the bad brain singles. And I was like, I'm getting all my pleasure from my ego. It's got nothing to do with the music. And at that point, it sort of severed something. I was like, this is just a lame version of some rich guy collecting cars and a Ferrari and Mercedes. And or I was like, I'm just some lame version of those other materialists. And once I put made that connection, 
everything sort of lost value for me because I, I was sort of on a spiritual pursuit. And when I realized it's pleasure for my ego, it just sort of like devalued everything. And to this point where the next few shows I played, I took some of those rare records and just started tossing them off the stage. Yeah, I heard about that, yeah. <laughs> and it was, I, I wrote about this in my book, and it, you know what? As crazy as it sounds, because some people would say, well, maybe you should have just sold them and used the money for a good charity. Maybe that would have been a smarter move, but what I did, it was very freeing to let go of something. Because it was almost letting go part. It was like throwing parts of my ego off the stage. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And also, and also, like I'm like that with records. Like I don't like to sell any of my old records. But if someone I know really wants something, I have joy in like giving them that record. I'm like, oh, if this is gonna bring you this much happiness, like here, dude. You know what I mean? Like, cool. Um, You know, nice way to look at it too. That's a really nice way to look at it too. If you can be that detached, you gotta get some joy out of this. If it's not just sitting in some safe somewhere yeah. then go ahead and enjoy it yeah the, the the only ones i still have some like my father called me and was like you got to get some of your stuff out of the attic at his old house and i found a bunch wow. of my records but i still have like test presses of like i got them from like the guitarist of the necros when i was a kid like a test press of one of the necros or the conquest for death seven inch and a test press of the process of elimination ep and all these like weird old records and i'm like it's wow. just, it's same thing though like i'm like what am i gotta do with it? like what am i gonna do with this stuff you know what i mean like and uh yeah I, that's where i'm at with I, that. <laughs> museum i think yeah so um i know you you know we're a little pressed for time not pressed for time but like you know i want to continue the story on like and, and you started to get into that like how did you find like how did you start like embarking on this spiritual path you said you started getting into how did you even like what made you even interested in yoga or hanging around at the ashram like to begin with like what like where did that come from? Um, I don't quite know where it came from, but I found that my like sort of joy to do while living in New York City was I was really into sort of like metaphysical books and books on, you know, Christ consciousness or macrobiotic diets or crystals or healing or fasting or cleansing. And it, it was just sort of like an interest of mine. And I found that these sort of like, ancient books of wisdom, Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Jonathan Livingston Seagull, things like that, sort of self-help books. This yeah. is what sort of inspired me. And the, and the, a lot of times they inspired my lyrics as well um, because I found them sort of uplifting and I found like there's a commonality in the spiritual path that as different as they are and coming from such different cultures, they also have a common thread. You know, I, I think we... I think it it would do us better as humans to see the commonality in different cultures than to always find the differences in them. And so the more I got into that, the more it led me to India and Eastern thought, which was a little bit more uh, inclusive as as opposed to exclusive. And um, it sort of wasn't a fear-based relationship with, with, with God. It was more of a concept like, you also have God within you and God is without and God is within. And I got sort of more and more attracted to the Eastern passion of thought. And then also the, the, the Krishna devotees would feed people on the street. So I, so that's how the cro got into all that stuff. And, um, uh, you know, the cro were, were great proselytizers of Eastern thought as well. Yeah. And, uh, Harley, uh, befriended me when I was a teenager and he used to tell me all about reincarnation and vegetarianism and things like that. And so that was another sort of, you know, sort of, you got to understand, like this stuff in the main, it, it, it just went hand in hand with all our, again, we were all, everybody was an outcast. Everybody was a freak. Everybody was a weirdo. And uh, sure enough, Eastern thought, vegetarianism or veganism it was all weird. No one, no one was a vegetarian. No one, no one went to a restaurant and asked for vegan options. That was that's, a, that's like a thing of this generation. So you had to be a little bit on the fringe, a little bit of a weirdo, to even be attracted to the stuff. And everybody just sort of hung out together there. It was all there on the Lower East Side, from freaky diets to freaky outfits to freaky religions to freaky, you know. Uh, 
hobbies and clothing and shoes and haircuts. It was all there on the Lower East Side. It was one-stop shopping for uh, uh, freakiness. Yeah. Yeah, before before New York was when when New York was still I don't know how to explain, it, but I, I hate the word gentrified. But before it was gentrified, when it was still the people, like you know what I mean. And, and there was it was a big mixing pot in there, like especially that area of town was was just wild. And 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 uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it definitely wasn't that gentrified there yeah. in nineteen two or eighty three, um, or even in better. the late eighties, even even you know. Yeah, yeah, for better for worse. Yeah, what it was what it was and um because i think sometimes because rents were cheap it attracted people who didn't have that much money but and sometimes those type of the people are the most artistic or more most creative yeah and i think the same happened with uh, same thing happened with soho in the in the 60s a lot of artists and bob dylan lived there um this so was the same type of thing so that 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 sort of travels around yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, I, I know there was like a, uh, you, you know, then at some point you kind of just kind of dropped off and, and, and got like fully into it and became a monk, right? Like, and like, yeah. And that, that also like all that stuff is also really explained in my book, but yeah. it, it, in short, there was like, you know, my band was doing successful at the time, by the time I had moved to New York city, my father had gotten sick and went into a coma. It was something with his, lung collapsed and it was sort of an ambiguous time where like is my father living or is he dead like yeah. in a coma they so they're they're not quite sure is there brain activity does he understand what you're saying is he is he a vegetable and i was sort of left in this you know i was left in a type of purgatory of like do i love him or is he a vegetable do i try to communicate with him and so it was a it, it truthfully it was a very difficult time in my life to deal with and to even understand. And my mother who the brunt of it all came on was visiting him regularly, but she sort of encouraged me to, you know, do my thing, but it still weighed heavy. And I think the heaviness was the reminder that this whole world is temporary yeah. and it isn't just him getting sick. And, and, and going in a coma. This is you. You're going to go in a coma. You're going to die somehow. And it might not be a coma. It might be you might get hit by a truck. You might get cancer. You might get shot. You might trip and fall down the stairs and break your neck. But I, this 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 type of frailty or, that we, that all of us have, we're just like a we're just like an egg, an eggshell that can crack at any moment. It was sort of like a. a, a, a I, I think like a, a firsthand wake up call mm -hmm. I ever had to, to come to realize how delicate we are as beings. And then as the band became more popular, I just realized like, what's the win here? Like, where are we going? It's like, okay, I'm getting more popular and I think we're doing good things. Like we're, we're vegetarians. We care about animals. We care about people. We care about, you know, clean living. We care about positive av attitudes. We live the clean life. But I know in my heart of hearts, like, Am I okay? I, I cut out the gross things, but these subtle things in my consciousness that I'm reading in all these books about super consciousness and our spiritual consciousness and our getting rid of uh, resentment and anger and greed and lust. And I'm not doing those fine tuned engineering of the mind. And I, I started becoming more and more attracted to that. I was like, how? I was like, how famous do I have to get to actually be joyful? Is there, a, is there a level of fame? Because I know people who are famous that kill themselves. Mm. I was like, what does it take to really be happy in the material world, especially knowing that at any time you could die? And so these were sort of questions that were like, like racing through my mind as my band became more successful was, how do you find lasting pleasure in a temporary world? And it was like, it was like this haunting, this haunting thing constantly tapping me on the shoulder. And when my father finally left my body and we put out our last record, it just, every, my spiritual trajectory sort of catapulted me forward. And I just said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. And the band was sort of shocked. But for me, it was, it was a natural step of 
who I wanted to become. And so, yeah, you know, pre cell phone, pre credit cards and pre internet, I, you know, got on a plane and just went to India because I always respected India as sort of a hub of spiritual information. And it always, it always has been historically. The, the Chinese went there, the Greeks went there, you know, when, when Greece was in its infancy, you know, it, it, there was already universities in India and, um, you know, so many people, it was a source of, you know, Columbus went there looking, Columbus came here looking for India. Yeah. Yeah. Just spice. And for they heard about the spices, he heard about the, the gold and he heard about the, the wealth and the depth of it. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what that, that's what drew me in. Uh, and, it, and at that point I was just, nothing would stop me. Yeah. Now I, and, I, I admire that just, just getting on the plane really like, and I don't know, I'm sure you get into this in the book, but like, like, how did you do it? Like what, like, um, did you have a destination or did you just fly out and be like, all right, it's, I'm going to trust that I'm going to find whatever it is I need to find. You know, I think anybody from our generation who traveled, you know, pre-internet, yeah. it was a whole different, and again, it was, you know, I didn't have a credit card, you know? Yeah. So I just travel with not even a lot of money. And I was just like hoping, you know, you look at a book and you, and you write, you send some air mails. Hey, I'm, I'm coming. Can I stay at your guest house and ashram from this date to this date? You wait for a reply and then you sort of go on that, but you really have no clue what you're getting into. Yeah. It was a, a much more real sense of adventure. Um, nowadays, you can just, you know, Google what's the best way to get to, um, to Delhi to yeah, yeah. bring There'll be like all these options will come up. You can take a taxi and take a trip. Uh, and you can have it translate live for you so you can talk easier to people and whatnot. And exactly. exactly. I mean, it's got, I mean, and also because I still travel to India regularly, the roads are better. The cars are better. The, you know, the, it, 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 it's safer. Um, there's highways. There were no highways. There was no roadside, you know, either, there, you know, if I go to Holy City now in India, there's a Starbucks on the way. It's unbelievable, you know. Yeah. And yeah. that it, I think before internet, and people have a hard time realizing this if they're not from that era. Was if you were to travel to these countries that at that time were very remote, there was no, uh, they had no access to what was going on in the West except a few magazines. Yeah, the and world was most, less was way less globalized. It wasn't. It was. It, it was globalized. So it, so fashion was unique to each country and part of their country. Yeah. Like there, 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 there came a time where, where even Europe, I remember driving through Germany and Germans dressed radically different than Italians who dressed radically different than the Dutch. And you could almost see who was European. If they came to America, they're obviously not American because, um, clothing and fashion was, was cultural. And then it got homogenized and we live sort of in a very homogenized world. And we're, we're seeing that with our food and our diets and our, we spread this type of globalism and I'm sure it's got some benefits, but you miss out on a lot of the flavors that these cultures had to offer as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know I I was like, and you know, I was an anthropologist and I had gotten an offer um, and you know, the the string of events that didn't come through, but they wanted me to go to Mongolia to uh, spend time with a, uh, a people that had had very limited Western contact and they wanted to document as much as they could before. Because oh, really? they, they know, you know, internet and all this stuff is coming. This was in the late 90s. And, um, and uh, they, they wanted me to kind of go out there to do that. But it was like a five or six year commitment. And at that point, I just couldn't do it. Oh. But that would have been, oh, it's one of the regrets of my life not doing that one, you know what I mean? But that would have been awesome, you know, and, and just documenting yeah. everything before they get that, touched. That, because once you get touched by the, uh, by the matrix, it, yeah. it changes, changes people. hundred percent. And then you, you got to work extra hard to get out of the matrix. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's still good locations, and I know you do some, like, uh, I know you do trips out there. Um, I'm sure you still know some, like, really good kind of, like, spots that have, like, retained their, their, the Yeah, that, their- that's what I do now, and that's sort of my passion is I create, I, I, you know, I create pilgrimages to holy places in India, 
And, you know, even though they're like, India's become, India's become big. Like I said, there's a beltway around Delhi and there's two major expressways going to the first holy town we go to. And it, it's like, but because I've gone there before all that stuff was built, I know where to go and who to meet and what to look for. And it's almost like a tour guide, a tour guide, a spiritual tour guide. And also there's, there's customs and tradition. There's, there's intentions to set before you go into a place. Um, uh, there's ways to behave in a holy place and there's books to read and there's there's things you shouldn't do that are culturally inappropriate or they're just not good for your inner engineering of your consciousness while you're in a holy place. Mm. So that's what I do. I try to set up sort of like spiritual adventures for people and that's, that's sort of my passion right now. We do that in Nepal and we do that in India. And uh, then, we do, then we do a trip in Italy also with my, uh, my podcast, by the way, I do a podcast. I didn't mention that, but we do a podcast for those who study yoga, want to study yoga philosophy. It's a, it's a daily uh, podcast on yoga philosophy called Wisdom of the Sages, and you can listen to it wherever you get, um, wherever you get podcasts and YouTube. And I, and the cool thing is, I do it with a friend who was also from that old New York hardcore scene. We both be, became Christian monks. Around the same time, he he got into it in eighty seven. I got into it in eighty eight. That's awesome, man. Um, do you, are you are you fluent? Like, can you like in, like can you read Sanskrit? Because I know you spent so much time. Are you like? Yeah, but I, I I can I can I can understand Hindi a little bit and yeah. uh, speak in Hindi, which is their sort of their national language. Yeah. Um. Because that's because like I lo- like that the the the. The, the just the writing looks so beautiful like and it's like but it's like it must be so hard to learn because you're not even using letters you know it's like um well you're not using the uh our, our letters know. yeah that's yeah. yeah it's a whole it's like going to japan and trying to understand a street sign it's like it's not saying first street second street yeah it's a whole alphabet so yeah you're, you're doing a different alphabet and um if you said if you said sanskrit is the uh like the latin of most of the okay, of most languages, but the, the national language is Hindi. So if yeah. you know a little, you can get around pretty easily. But you know the British occupied India for a long time, and so there's a lot of people speak English. Sure, sure. Um, I'm just doing a time check here because I know you had uh, other obligations. Um, yeah. do you, is this this a point where you need to wrap up? Yeah, just um, thanks for the good questions. You sort of like breezed through my whole book sort of with a few questions. And um, um, it's nice to talk to somebody from that generation of music yeah. because it was a magical time in the music scene. And um, yeah, and I try in my book to tell my story from when I first got into doing music gigs, going to New York City and what it was like then and and then my entrance into my spiritual life and traveling through India and then living in an ashram and restarting a band again, which sure. was a real, yeah, we didn't even talk really, about shelter. That's like, that's huge. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was not only peculiar for, um, uh, for myself and for the music scene, it was very peculiar for, you know, the spiritual ashram to have a, a punk band living in their ashram. Yeah. But, um, it was a cool. It was a cool time of life, and it, it, it turns out to be a pretty in- informative story in my journey. And I think my hope is to have people find their own journey within my journey. Um, not not that people become me or find my path, but sometimes when you read books like this about people struggling with their demons and trying to deal with their ego, it sometimes helps you mirror your own struggles and your own. Uh, uh, mountain peaks you want to climb in your life, and that sort of like will be the uh, uh, that, that will be my, my my the greatest thing I can give the reader is if they can if it can help them in any way with the things that they're struggling through, sure. and maybe maybe uh, miss get out of some of the pain that I went through by like learning a lesson that I had to learn a hard way. Yeah. Sometimes though, that's the only time people are going to learn it. You know, even myself, sometimes it's like I can read all kinds of things, but I ain't going to learn it till I learn it the hard way. <laughs> but you, at least you're open to it, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
Um, what I'm going to do, uh, all, all your information, I'm going to have your website and like the link to your podcast and the, uh, the, the book pre-order and all that stuff uh, on the show notes. So people don't have to memorize it. Like I'll, I'll have it in the notes. So just check that out later. Um, I do want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I have so many more questions, so I hope we get to do this again and hopefully sometime like in person where it'll be a, a little bit easier to navigate. Um, I'm going to um, have, have you stay on the line uh, and hold on one second. I'm going to, I'm going to shut the uh, recording off, but I'm going to stay on the line for one second. Uh, but again, thank you so much for coming on today. This is awesome. And I hope we can continue the conversation sometime. Thank you, my friend. That was great. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom. Like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary.